praise the Lord. Um, let us have our seats. I want to use this um, opportunity again to thank our overseer, our senior pastor, and other pastorates for giving us this opportunity with the medical team to continue this wonderful topic. Last week, Sunday, um, last Sunday rather, we started a topic known as diabetes mellitus, which we call DM. Today, we are going to continue on it. We will just summarize everything we've learned last week. So if you have any question after this, then we, the medical team, by the grace of God, we are here to answer any form of questions. So last week, Sunday, we were able to establish the fact that we were able to define diabetes mellitus, which otherwise is known as DM. We said diabetes mellitus is um, a group of metabolic disorder characterized by high blood sugar level in the blood, you know, as a result of the fact that there is usually inadequate insulin or lack of insulin or the body is resistant to insulin. Today, I'm not going to be talking much on um, using medical terms so that we can understand very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, however, I said that um, diabetes, why do we need to know about diabetes and hypertension? We said because they can affect the organs in our body, and we know that we all have vit um, vital organs in the body, which are the kidney, the heart, you know, the brain. So we don't want some of these ailments to affect these vital organs in our body. So we said diabetes level, for we to say an individual has diabetes, there's a diagnostic level for it. So it means that normal sugar level, we must know the normal sugar level, that is the fasting blood sugar, which is 3.8 to 6.1 millimole per liter. In some diagnostic center, they can use milligram per DL, which is 70 to 110 milligram per DL. So between 110 to 125 is pre-diabetes. The person is not, is not yet confirmed a diabetic patient, just in that pre-diabetic phase. But once it's greater than 126 milligram per DL, or once it's greater than 7.0 millimol per liter, then we say the person has diabetes. So also on Sunday, we are able to understand the fact, we are able to explain the epidemiologists. How do we come about this? We said before that diabetes usually occur in developed countries. But now, we can now see it in developing countries you know, in Nigeria, third world country, Nigeria, Africa in general. Why? Because of urbanization, our lifestyle. So we were able to establish the epidemiology. Then we went to pathophysiology. We said normally that the function of insulin in our blood system is to absorb glucose into the body cell. That is number one. And also is to convert excess glucose, excessive sugar into glycogen. We now say sometimes because there is no insulin in the body that can do this. What happens is that the, all the old sugar goes down into the kidney, then we can now excrete it. And when we excrete it like that, then there is sugar in our urine. Then I now said, as we are excreting sugar in the urine, so also we can become tasty because water cannot be absorbed into the system, so we can now be urinating a lot of water. And that is what we call frequent urination. At night, we said you, we can also urinate, you know, more at night, more than before. An individual can just come to the hospital because of frequent urination or urinating much at night. The person will just say, doctor, uh, you know, I've been urinating more than five, six times and I can't cope with it again. What can I do? So the doctor can just say, okay, well, it may be diabetes, go and do fasting blood sugar. So that is how it goes. So, in, in, in other words, so in other words, so we can have what we call frequent urination then. Because you are urinating too much, then an individual can become tasty. You need water. Then because you are urinating glucose, sugar that you're supposed to use for the body, then that person can be eating too much, you know, eating too much. So I said I'm not going to use medic medical terms. So when we get to the symptoms, I will explain some of these 
nature. So that is the pathophysiology for us. Then the next one, we talk about the types of diabetes. He said we have three types of diabetes, but majorly we have two types. We have the type 1, type 2, and the third one is gestational diabetes. We said the type 1 diabetes is otherwise called insulin dependent, or what we call early onset. We said this type of diabetes occurs as a result of the fact that there is, a, there is an inadequate insulin or lack of insulin. Because of this, an individual can have diabetes. And don't forget, because there is usually inadequate or lack, so that is why we call it early onset. So an individual can have diabetes at a very tender age. So I said if I see somebody having DM, that is diabetes, at age 13, I would not be surprised. I would be thinking more of type 1 diabetes. Then we say type 2 is when there is insulin resistance. There is insulin, but the body, you know, cannot make use of that insulin. That is type 2. And this occurs as a result of the fact that we acquired it. So because of that, we call it maturity onset. It occurs later in life, above 40 years, you can see type 2 diabetes. And I said it is the most commonest diabetes, type 2. You know, as a, this usually occurs due to different kind of things, but majorly acquired. For example, when you see obese people, they can, you know, have diabetes, that, which is type 2. You know, excessive caloric intake, alcohol intake, and people that are smoke. So they can actually have type 2 diabetes. Then we say type 3, um, sorry, gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes occurs as a result of the fact that the person is pregnant. Immediately after the pregnancy, the sugar level comes back to normal. So that one is usually not too common. It's specific to pregnant women. Then after that, we now talk of causes of diabetes. We talk of causes. We say type 1, that it is genetics, it is hereditary. But type 2, we acquired it. And what, is, what do we mean by acquired? For example, a lot of people that are obese, you understand? The research was done in China, you know, because they eat, you know, fatty food. So they saw that people that are obese, usually they, most of them have type 2 diabetes. So obesity, you know, eating too much. It's not even eating too much. Eating fatty foods, you know, high caloric intake food can cause that. So cigarette smoking, tobacco smoking, alcohol intake, all these are the causes of type 2 diabetes. Then we go to symptoms and signs. I normally say that in our patho pathophysiology, I say something that, you know, uh, one of the symptoms is that we, the, an individual urinate too much from that pathophysiology. So frequent urination, you, you know, that is busy for encounter for most people. You just say, doctor, I've been urinating too much. So frequent urination, some of them will tell you that I feel tasty, so I drink excessive water. So uh, excessive water intake, um, eating too much, that is, they just eat anything, junks, anything they see. Weight loss, blood vision, some of them, they can't see very well. When you tell them to just check around, they will tell you I can't see anything. So weight loss, numbness, some of them, they cannot feel their hands again. In short, in males, there could be erectile dysfunction. So one of the uh, one of the um, causes of erectile dysfunction is you know when the sugar is high. So all these are general causes of um, um, general symptoms and signs of diabetes. Also, I don't want to go into some of those diseases. Talking of those uh, cosmos breathing, you know, and all those things that occur in DKA. So now, after knowing the signs and symptoms, don't forget that we said we have complications if sh sugar level is not being controlled in the body, there are complications, a lot of issues that can occur, like hypertension too. So one of it is kidney failure, heart failure, stroke, liver failure. Apart from those um, organ failures, in diabetes, I said we can have DKA and HHS, but I'm not going into that today. So now, so how do we investigate? How do we, you know, diagnose? Apart from that, I said something that we have what we call differential diagnosis, which I will still talk about. But how do we diagnose diabetes? I said it last week, Sunday, that there are three major things or three major ways we can diagnose diabetes. Number one, using the fasting blood sugar. If the fasting blood sugar is greater than 126 milligram per DL, the person has diabetes, most likely. Now, if the random blood sugar, what is random blood sugar? 
Red of blood sugar exists when you've taken something, either water or you've eaten or you've taken something. So that is random blood sugar. So when the random blood sugar is greater than 140 milligrams per day, then it is diabetes. Also, I, I said something last week, so I, talk, I said something about two hours oral glucose tolerance test, two hours OGTT. I said to perform two hour OGTT, what it means is that an, um, 75 gram of glucose is dissolved in 300 mils of water. Then you tell an individual to take it. After two hours, you measure, you measure the sugar level. If the sugar level is greater than 11.1 millimole per day, that is greater than 200 milligram per day, then definitely that is um, diabetes. So, and don't forget that an individual might have fat, fasted overnight. So, the person will not eat anything, you know, overnight. So, those are the three ways of diagnosing diabetes. Also, I mentioned something like glycated hemoglobin, HbA1c. I said that that one measures the level, average level of glucose in the body. If it is greater than 6.5%, then the person has diabetes. One good thing with glycated hemoglobin is that it can measure you know, amount of sugar over few months, over three, four, five months. So it can establish that this person has, you know, has diabetes for over a few months or few years. Also, it can be used to regulate the uh, sugar level. If the sugar level, if one, if the sugar level is improving, then we can through that, like catered demoglobin, we can know. So all these are ways in which we can diagnose, you know, DM. Another thing we should not take note is that I said there are some differential diagnoses. Differential diagnoses are those things that mimic a particular disease, but it's not that disease. And I mentioned like three. The first one I mentioned was urinary tract infection, UTI. I said in this case, a lot of people come to the hospital, they will be urinating, frequent urination. But the difference between UTI and DM is that in UTI, usually they don't, their sugar level is normal. Also, you can have something like benign prostatic apoplexia, BPH, that usually occurs in elderly people, or CAP, cancer of the prostate. In cancer of the prostate, these people too, they come down with frequent urination. But the only difference is that most of the time, the sugar is normal. And sometimes when you do their PSA, prostatic specific antigen, is usually you know, higher. You know, the normal is zero to four nanogram per minute. So greater than you can see something like 10 or 15 or 20, then you now know that, no, this is not diabetes. Rather, this is um, BPH or cancer of the prostate. Then another differential diagnosis is what we call diabetes insipidus. I say diabetes insipidus occur when an hormone is not available or is inadequate. And I mentioned the name of the hormone, ADH. I said the function of the hormone is to reabsorb water into the, and into the system. But sometimes, because this hormone is not there to reabsorb water, what happens is that an individual starts urinating. And in this type of urination, the person can stay anywhere, probably in the toilet, and urinate for up to 30 minutes. You understand? But in diabetes, the person is frequent urination. The person can go now and urinate. After five minutes, the person will wake up again and urinate. After two minutes, the person... So that is the difference between... So from the history, if the person does tell you that, I will just go to the toilet and start urinating for like... You should know that that is not... It's most likely to be diabetes insipidus, not diabetes mellitus. So that is how you can differentiate. So how do you investigate diabetes? What are the investigate? Number one, history taking is very important. History taking... You know, you want to know, is it type 1 or type 2? Then you want to do the fasting blood sugar or the random blood sugar. If the person is obese, you want to know the level of cholesterol that is in the person's body. You want to do your urinalysis to get some fat, to, to get if there is infection, if there is ketone, if there is protein and all those things. You want to know, you want to do your full blood count. It will also tell you the number of the PCV and infection. So you want to do all those things to actually know. You want to do your glycated hemoglobin, don't forget. You want to do your urinalysis. You want to do other things too, like don't forget that diabetes can, you know, occur with hypertension. So most people that have diabetes, 
they also have a potential. So you have to be very careful. You want to do, you know, chest X-ray, your ECG, you know, you want to do your EUCR, everything. You even want to differentiate between DKA and HHS, all those things I said. You want to differentiate. So you can do series of, you know, tests, depending on what you are looking for. But some tests are very important, constant. Fasting blood sugar is very important. BP is very important. BMI, you know, body mass index. I told you how to calculate it. Weight over what? I squared. So greater than taxi is obeyed. You understand? So all these are what we want to know when an individual comes to meet us. So you want to do series of, you want to do C peptide, you know, um, tests to differentiate between type 1 and type 2. So all these are the tests you want to now. The next thing is prevention. I normally tell people that, you know, prevention is better than cure. How do you prevent it? For type 1, there's nothing anybody can do about that. You understand? There's nothing. Because most of the time, it's genetics. That is why you can see it in a um, seven-year-old boy can have type 1 diabetes. So there's nothing except God intervention. But type 2, we can control it. You understand? If the person is obese, the person can reduce weight. If the person normally takes fatty food, like junks and all this, so the person can reduce it, that fatty food. If the person takes alcohol, tobacco, smoking, the person can stop all those things. Then by so doing, we can see that um, type 2 diabetes may be controlled or may not even come at all. So that is how to, you know, to prevent. Now, I normally tell people that um, before I go to treatment, prognosis, Prognosis is usually very good when it is detected very early. And not only that it's detected very early, I've seen some um, patients, when they come to you, they will tell you that, doctor, ah, you, it's not easy to be taking drugs every blessed day. And you understand the, what the patient is saying. Even malaria tablet for three days, a lot of us, when we start it, probably we're having it. Once you take one tablet, the next day, you will stop it. I believe it has happened to almost everybody, including me. So, you know, it's not easy to be swallowing drugs every day. But these people, that is what they will do, you know, till the rest of their life, except God intervenes. So, when you tell them, Madam, you have not taken your drug, they will say, ah, doctor, it's not easy, you know. So, compliance is very, very key. The person takes his or her drug every blessed day. Every blessed day. So, now, what is the treatment? The treatment and uh, the treatment and management. The treatment is very easy. When, if it is pre-diabetic phase or stage, the treatment, you don't need any drug. When the fasting blood sugar is between 110, 110 to 125, you don't need any drug. It's not up to 126 yet. What the person does need is what? Lifestyle modification. What are the lifestyle modifications? I've been saying lifestyle modifications. What are the lifestyle modifications? Diet, number one. Dietary control. In short, that is why in teaching hospital, in general hospital, they have dietitians that, you know, if, you know, for diabetic patients in the world, they, they can't eat anything. You know, they, they give them the, you know, the plan, the dietary plan. Now, what kind of food can we, you know, it's always a problem when you are explaining to diabetic patient that, don't eat this. Don't eat. They will not tell you, doctor, what, what do you think I can now eat? You've told me not to eat this, not to eat that. No, what, can, what do you think I can eat? Now, I normally tell them that apart from the, what diet do you think you can eat? Yes, you can eat beans. You know, you eat beans regularly. You can eat um, what you about to call more money. Very good. Then you can eat unripe plantain. These are the food. You should cut down sugar. You don't need... Uh, yeah, coke, uh, fun, anything sugary. You don't need that. So, you eat um, um, plantain, wheat. Those are what they can eat. And also, somebody can ask, in Nigeria, most of our food are carbohydrate food. We all agree, isn't it? Yes. We have rice, amala, eba, and all those things. But, what we normally tell them is that, we tell them to make a feast, something like this. The food you, you will eat must not be more than this in a day. In any, for example, if I want to take rice now, this is the amount of rice I must eat. I must not eat a bowl. Anything more than this, diabetic patient is eating excessively. So, 
<laughs> it's usually very difficult. That is the truth of the matter. But that is what we should do. When you tell them to make a feast, something like this, in the morning, you must not, the meat, everything must not be more than this. Yes. Yes, that is it. If you want to eat rice, a bar, it must not be more than this. Anything more than this, it is, you know, you are going against the plan. So, it must not be more than that. So, if you want to eat rice, just take this kind of, um, you know, fish. Then you now put a lot of vegetables on it. You understand? To support it. And because over time we see that most people that have diabetes, they also have hypertension most of the... So, what we tell them to do is that you don't eat as you are trying to control diabetes. You will be looking at hypertension with your other... So, what we tell them to do is that you don't eat... Um, you eat most of, you eat fish. Don't eat meat at all, red meat. Don't eat chicken or turkey, you know, that is for hypertension. Then even if you want to eat turkey or um, um, turkey or chicken once in a while, you must remove the skin. Very important. So, don't, and don't eat, don't, most of them will come, what of bon vita, what of milo, what of, stop all those things. You don't need to do it. Now, if you want to take some uh, milk, you can just take dano milk. It's good. It's not rich in fatty food. Then, for um, hypertensive patients, you can take um, banana is very good. Then, cucumber too is good. So, those are the food we should take. We should not just eat anyhow. Anything fatty food, meat pie, egg grow, fish, every, that, there is no need for all those things. So, we should stream our food. So in the morning, there is a plan. In the morning, somebody can eat beans, a diabetic patient. In the afternoon, they can eat more money. In the evening, you can just eat unripe plantain alone. You understand? So those are the, so the next day, in the night, you can just eat wheat. If you want to eat rice in the morning, just something like this, something like a feast. So by so doing, somebody that is in pre-diabetic phase, if, without any drugs, just check the um, sugar level. Automatically, you just see that the sugar level drops to like 70, 80. No good uh, glycemic control. But the problem is that when you tell the patient not to eat all those things, it is those things you are telling them not to eat. That is what they will be eating. And when they now come to the hospital, you just see the sugar level that you know you have been controlling, you are very happy from 80, you just see something like 250. You understand? You might be asking, what did you eat overnight? I just ate uh, amala. Do you, uh, do you follow this? Food? He said, ah, no, not, ah, I just, it's just once, once. You understand? So it is not easy, but that is just the, 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 the game. So, so the next, but somebody that is already in established diabetic um, phase, what you just need to do, at that phase, the person keeps taking drugs. Either, you know, uh, metformin, that is by granite, metformin, Glucophage, you know, Daolin and, and you know, Glamiperide and all these drugs. So, and another thing I normally tell those people is that we must have glucometer at home. I've seen somebody, and again, when you see that, that is why this lecture is very important. 70 to 110. And you're having 50. You should not take the drug. You see some people, they will say, ah, no, doctor said, you must, you must. So they will take the job. Before you know, they start feeling dizzy. They start doing some, some of them will land in the hospital. So we tell them that always check your sugar level before you take any anti-diabetic drug. So you check your, because hypoglycemia is more deadly than what? Hyperglycemia. Hypo keep faster. You understand? Hypo keep faster, hypotension keep faster than hypertension. So, the rule of the game is that before you take your anti-diabetic anti drugs, check your sugar level. And everybody must have glucometer. In short, you see some um, cooperative patients, they have exercise book. You know, in the morning, they will check, they write it down. This is my fasting blood sugar. Uh, in the afternoon, this is my random blood sugar. In the evening, so that when they are coming to the clinic, they will bring it. In case you, you are telling them another thing, or your machine is not reading the normal thing. They will say, doctors, look at it. I've been doing it for like two weeks. It has been okay. So you can actually tell the patient to go and repeat it again. Probably it's, uh, you know, machine error. So all these things guide the doctor. So once 
it is we are once the person is in um, diabetic phase, the only remedy is just to keep taking drugs and to keep you know you know compliance with the diet and with all those lifestyle modification. Now, the next thing is the summary and conclusion. I normally tell people, I normally tell people that, you know, diabetes, most people will ask, can it be cured? Diabetes cannot be cured, but it can be managed very well. If God says the person is going to live up to, manage that we are trying to say, that is what I'm explaining. If God says the person is going to live up to 110 or 120, the person will live up to that, um, that but the person will be taking the person will be normal. There will be no complication. So the complication can be reduced by just proper awareness, like as you are doing in Calvary Bible Church, and also timely management or treatment. So I believe by now we have done justice to the topic. Thank you, God bless you. So, okay, questions and answers. We have questions, questions and answers. Praise the Lord. The way I've written questions. So, first state team, please come up. First state team, please come up. Okay, if you have questions, can I see your hands up? If you have questions, please stand up. Stand up. Okay, can we come out here if you have questions? The ones written, bring them. Yes, if you have questions, just come out. Okay, so tell us your name, then your question. Thanks. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. I must say thank you very much, especially for today. You have made it. Uh, my name is Priya Denedi. You have made today. Am I, can you hear me? Hello. Okay. okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Priya Denedu, and I must say a very big thank you, especially for today. You made it very easy for every one of us to flow along with you. Sunday was like, you know, learning Latin. So thank you very much <laughs> for that. Um, having said that, I wrote a couple of questions down. Thank you. Because even today, I had uh, a meeting online with someone, and this kind of issue came up. So I wrote it down. I said... What is your advice to people suffering from either high blood pressure or low, low blood sugar or high blood pressure? Okay. They are almost close yeah. as, okay. you know. Or people suffering from such. And you hear things like uh, they should take a lot of uh, bitter leaf, scent leaf, ginger, and all of those things that it actually help. So I say, what is your advice to such kind of people? And how healthy is such kind of self-care? Then the last one, that's why the result they claim. And then what are the side effects of taking such? Because when you ask them, they will tell you that, okay, somebody used such and they are okay, so, you know, they go ahead. Are there side effects? Even though I know that such things are natural to us, we use them for our soup making, especially as women. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes, um, I normally tell people that um, all this, though ginger, some of these things are actually good. They're actually good. But too much of everything is not good. You understand? So, because, so for example, ginger helps in clearing, you know, visions and all those things. But, it cannot take the place of drugs. For example, let me give you an example. I've seen somebody that 
has diabetes, well controlled. The person, so somebody now advised the woman that, ah, I know somebody somewhere that wants to take this drug and all this Arba stuff, that you don't, you don't need any, you don't even need to take any drugs again throughout, you know, your st throughout, throughout life. So the woman was so very happy. She said, oh, that is what I've been looking for. So they gave the woman, the woman stopped the orthodox meds and the woman started taking the, the next time we saw that woman, the woman came in coma. You understand? So some of those things, we don't even know, you know, we don't know the amount of any regimen we got. All those orthodox medicine, we know what it uh, entails. We know the percentage of this, percentage of that. We know we, we work with dosage, but in Abba meds they don't work with dosage. They can just tell you to take anything. So that is why there is still there is no there is no reason why anybody should stop his or her medications, either anti-hypertensive or anti-diabetic. Thank you. Well, most of the time I tell people that because some of those things. They can go, you know, there could be contraindication, you know, there, can, there could be adverse side effects. That is taking autodos and taking other things. So if you want to take autodos, stick with it. If you want to take another thing, take it. But I, I prefer autodos than any other thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the question came in from someone. The person says, God bless you, sir. I take a lot of soft drink. In fact, I take at least a bottle each day. I do check my sugar level and always normal. I'm a bit fat, but I notice that I'm always thirsty at night and I urinate about five to seven times. Sir, is that a sign of diabetics? Okay, thank you so much for your question. So to quickly respond to this, um, I mean, even though you have checked your, um, blood, uh, your sugar level, it's not enough to say you are diabetic. What am I saying this? If you notice that in cold weather, or some of us who stay under AC from morning till night, and then you're drinking water, you will urinate more. Why? Because your body also finds a way to make sure that it excretes that fluid okay, you're taking. So please, additionally, I feel I mean, if you are not using AC in your house, you can still recheck to confirm that you are not diabetic. Thank you. Can, can frequent intake of water blended with banana increase sugar level in the body? Well, um, normally banana should not increase, increase sugar level. In short, I said it in a, it's in a banana is even good, especially for people that have hypertension because it increases the potassium level in the body. So if um, the norm, uh, normal insulin, everybody, uh, everything is okay, banana should not increase sugar level. So it should not. So thank you. Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, what does it mean when you have hand sucking, fisting, or your urine? Does diabetes have anything to do with back pain? Okay, number one, what does it mean? Yeah, that, you know, I said something that when you urinate, um, when you have uh, diabetes or something, or it may not even be diabetes, it may be the fact that there's high level of sugar in your body. So when you urinate, uh, uh, when you urinate, so when you start seeing ants, you know, dancing on the urine, then... <laughs> Something, you know, something is wrong. So that person have to go and that is the truth of the matter. So the person, in short, in the olden days, that is how they normally, you know, dictate. If somebody have, uh, you know, in medicine, I don't want to mention the name now. So, you know, sugar and urine. So once it's, in short, when that person probably do um, urinalysis, there's what we call urinalysis, you can now see glucose. They will tell you to urinate. After you probably money, you measure. So when, once you urinate, they will now use that urinalysis strip to check. And once they check, the glucose can be plus, plus. It can even be plus. It can be plus, plus, plus. So that person should just go and do tests. Thank you. Okay, another thing is that can, can 
diabetes cause, can diabetes lead to back pain? In short, a lot of things can cause back pain. Not only, what I, be, I believe what the person wants to say is that can uh, high blood sugar level cause his back pain? A lot of things can, yes, it can. But they, there are like 50 causes of back, back pain. So it may not be only that. So the person should go to the lab or to meet a doctor so they can rule out other things that can actually cause back pain. So but diabetes too can lead to that. Okay, so a question here. I have a question here that says, I have been having pains on my lower part of my belly for years now, sometimes on the right side, sometimes on the left. What is going on, please? If I try to urinate during um, those times, it's quite painful. I mean severe pain. Okay, so my response is this, please. Um, it is not enough to make um, a hasty diagnosis of your problem. There is what we call... Um, comprehensive history taking. So you have to visit a physician or a doctor in any facility that is close to you. Let's take proper history, then let you undergo investigations. You might have to do an ultrasound scan or other tests to ensure that we can make a definitive diagnosis of a problem. Thank you. Okay. There's another question here. Does the idea of using exercise to burn sugar really work? Yes, it works. Yes. So that is why if you work very hard in the morning, or for example, if you do not eat early in the morning, you are just working, you will see that your sugar level automatically goes down, isn't it? So by the time you just take glucose, something like Coke, you see that you can work very well. So as you work, yeah, you are burning, uh, uh, burning down sugar. Another question is that I've heard people say you can take a lot of uh, sugary stuff. So far, you can burn it out. No. <laughs> that does, now, another thing I have to tell you is that the more you grow older, your insulin is working every day. So and the more you are growing older, your insulin becomes very, you know, you know, it doesn't, your pancreas rather becomes very weak, so it may not produce enough insulin. So, don't, so as you are going to know that, so don't, because of what I've been saying, I want to be taking sugar. So as you are going to know that, that is like later, that's what we are saying, that later in life, an individual that is elderly now may develop that just because of what the person has been doing in the back. Uh, in the past, rather. All right. Okay, so I have um, a question here. I'll read them, maybe probably after I read the first, I have like four questions here. So after I read the first one, I'll let him um, also answer a question from his own um, booklet. So I have here, so uh, doctor, please how many times can a person urinate at night to ascertain he or she is not diabetic? Okay. Thank you so much for your question. However, that's vague. I mean, it's, it's not certain. Okay, we cannot make diagnosis from um, the number of frequency of times you actually you are passing urine. So a diagnosis is made via investigation, please. But if you notice you are urinating too much, like we have one of those symptoms you mentioned, please, don't hesitate to visit a physician, okay, to know what the problem might be. Thank you. Please, sir, is sugar level of 99 high or normal? For a 17-year-old girl, it's very normal. I said it before. If it is, even if it is around of fasting, fasting blood sugar is 70 to 110. And you're having 99. It's very okay. It's normal. Okay. A question here is for a woman who developed diabetes in pregnancy. After delivery, the diabetes refuses to go as expected. What can be done to cure it? Okay, just to, um, just to um, throw in the line of what he said before, he said that diabetes is not curable, but it's manageable. So um, in this case, it might be that it wasn't picked when she was before she, when she wasn't pregnant. Okay, but however, we now pick the pick that she was diabetic during pregnancy, and that's why even postpartum she's still diabetic. Okay, so all we need to do is to um, commence on anti-diabetic agents and she can control it with her diet and exercise. Thank you. Okay, this is the thank you. Oh, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for this. Does taking drugs regularly to regulate high blood pressure has side effect? If yes, how can it be avoided? There is no drug that doesn't have side effect. That is number one. If you Google um, paracetamol side effect, uh, you will see more than 50 side effects. That does paracetamol. So you now look at the side effects and the benefits. 
So if the bed never at least decide the fate, then you go for it. So that is how we do it. Okay, a question. I have a question here, and it says, for a man who has prostrate enlargement, what can be done to prevent it from becoming prostrate cancer? So my response is this: there is what we call early detection and early diagnosis. Okay, so if um, someone has a prostate enlargement, which can be prostatitis, which can be um, benign prostatic hyperplasia, like he said, we can also be cancer of the prostate. All we need to do is for you to go to um, a urologist for what early diagnosis. Let's know what is what the person has. Is it a cancer or it is not? And then if it's not a cancer, we can now probably do prostatectomy to remove the prostate, okay? If it's prostatitis, we can treat with antibiotics and it will resolve. If it is cancer, we look at the level of spread, okay? If it is still within the capsule, then we can start chemotherapy to make sure that the patient is fine. Thank you. My mom was diagnosed with high blood pressure of 165. I want to know if it can be regulated or not, and how long does it need to take to regulate it? Now, this question is not specific. You know, in blood pressure, it's not just one figure. You have the systolic and diastolic. You know, it's 165. Is this systolic? Well, let me assume it's systolic. 165 over something. That systolic is high, 165. And what the, the person needs is just to see a physician. You understand? So they will prescribe some medication and they will do follow-up. That is what the person needs. Thank you. Okay, so my last question here says, what advice do you have for a patient who wants to undergo a surgery called prostate biopsy? Okay, so prostate biopsy is a procedure, not a surgery actually. So it's, um, a, it's a test, it's an investigation that is used to ascertain, for example, in this case that for a doctor to request for prostate biopsy simply means the prostate is enlarged, okay? And then they want to know the level of the cells within the prostate, okay? Is it benign cells that we have there within the prostate, or is it cancerous cells? It will now give, um, it will now guide the doctor to make an informed decision, okay, whether he is dealing with a cancer or whether he is dealing with a benign condition. So please let he, let the person just um, who actually is due for um, prostate biopsy go for a biopsy so that he can have an informed decision about the condition. Thank you. I read on online about late urination can cause bladder infection. Women, women can't use public toilet like men do. Right. All right. Um, what is there is that late urination, you can urinate anytime. That does not mean that the person will have infection. How do we get infection when you use dirty toilets, you understand, especially women, you know, because of their anatomy. So the person can have infection. So, because you are urinating late at night does not mean you have infection. And once the person is feeling that, okay, I'm urinating too much, you understand, the person can just go to the hospital. In the hospital, they can do what we call, you know, uh, urine MCS and, you know, anything that is there, whether it's bacteria or stuff. So, the urine MCS will also suggest the um, treatment uh, methodology. So, they will use it to treat the person. So, that is how it goes. Thank you. God bless.